finding your seat and settling in, just what the countdown said, I want to welcome you to church. So glad you came to church today. We want to welcome you to North Jacksonville Baptist Church. We're glad that you're here with us, and we're so excited about what God has in store for us today. If you're visiting with us today, we're really glad that you're here. It's a really big deal where you go to church and where you choose to worship, and we, uh, we take it very seriously. We're very honored that you came to worship with us. If you are here for the first time, we'd love for you to fill out a Connect card, because we want to thank you personally for coming today, talk to you about your visit, answer any questions you might have. So if today's your first time, or maybe you've been a couple of times and have never done this, we'd love for you to fill out a Connect card. You should be able to find it on the pew right in front of you, and if you grab one of those, fill it out on both sides. What you're going to do with that card is hold on to it until this service is done, and before you go home, stop out in the lobby on the right-hand side of the Connect Center and drop that card in the box that's there, and we'll follow up with you this week. And if you came prepared to give your tithes and offerings, which I hope you did, there's several ways where you can do that. You passed some silver boxes on your way into the sanctuary upstairs and downstairs. You can drop those uh, offerings off in those silver boxes. There's two iPads out at the Giving Center on the left-hand side you can use, and then the church website as well. You can give through that platform, and you've been so faithful to give, and the ministry of this local church is happening because of the faithfulness of God's people giving, and so we're so grateful for that. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer and prepare our hearts for worship. I want you to be praying for two things. One, I want to thank you uh, for praying for my mom. She had surgery on Friday. It went well. They fixed everything they needed to fix, and so she's got um, some recovery in front of her. They wanted me to thank you for praying for her, for dad, uh, for sending you know, so many kind thoughts, words, messages. Uh, you've just been so gracious. Church really is a family, and it's thankful in times like these that we have a family to lean on, and thank you for being that family to us. We're so grateful. So continue to pray for her as she recovers, and also be in prayer uh, for our young adult ministry. We had over 40 young adults who were at a retreat this weekend up in North Carolina. They all traveled up there, had a great time. They're going to be traveling back, as you've seen on the news and felt this morning. Weather is pretty uh, pretty perilous in some parts of the country, so we just want them to get home safe, and we're thankful that all that God did in their lives this week, and all that he did this morning, had a great Bible study hour, we've had one great service, but as we say every time, this hasn't happened yet. We're not living on what's happened already. We're living in anticipation of what God's going to do right now. We believe he's got a fresh word, fresh touch, that the presence of God is here in our midst, and we want to make sure we're ready to receive what God has in store for us. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you today in the name of Jesus. And God, we're so thankful for this day. God, we don't want to take for granted all that you've blessed us with. But God, we start with who you are, that you are faithful, that you are true, that you're the one true living God. There is no other God but you. And that God, even though our sin separated us from you, God, you made a way. God, when we couldn't make a way, we made a mess we couldn't fix with sin. But God, you made a way through Jesus Christ. And he lived, and we believe that the Bible's actually true. We believe that Jesus really came from heaven to earth, that he really lived a sinless life, that he really died on the cross in the place of sinners. We believe he really died. We really believe he was really buried, but that he really came back to life. God, it's not fairy tales. It's not some story we hope is true. We know it's true because you've made it known to us through your word. And so, God, we're thankful that in Christ we can be saved from our sin. We can be made right with God. We can have a, a new beginning, be made a new creation, that, God, you can put it all back together. And, God, I prayed this morning if there's somebody here who's lost, they've never been saved. God, I pray they'd get saved today. And, God, I pray for the person who's in bondage to sin. I pray you'd set them free today, that they would come to you to set them free as only you can. Pray for the one who's discouraged, that they would find their hope today in you alone. And God, I pray that the work that needs to be done in our hearts, that you would do it as only you can. And I pray that as we sing, that we would sing from a place of gratitude for who you are and for all you've done. And God, that we would sing praises that would be pleasing to your ears. And that God, as I preach the word, that God, it would be the message that your people need to hear. And that God, it would be what the Bible says and that your word would do the work. God, I pray when that invitation time comes that people wouldn't hesitate, that they wouldn't delay, that they wouldn't postpone, but in faith and obedience and with, with expedience that, God, they would respond to the gospel and be saved. God, do a fresh work today. Do it right now. God, I pray it would begin in me, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. What a great morning of praise and worship. I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles. Turn to the Old Testament book of Genesis, first book of the Bible, into chapter 33. Genesis chapter 33 is where we'll be this morning. The title of my message is Rebuilding Broken Bridges. Rebuilding Broken Bridges from Genesis chapter 33. I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. So I'm going to ask you to take your copy of God's Word and let's all stand together to honor the reading of God's Holy Word together. It says, now Jacob looked up and saw Esau coming toward him with 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two slave women. He put the slaves, at their chil- the slaves and their children first, Leah and her children next, Rachel and Joseph last. He himself went on ahead and bowed to the ground seven times until he approached his brother. But Esau ran to meet him, hugged him, threw his arms around him and kissed him. Then they wept. And when Esau looked up and saw the women and children, he asked, Who are these with you? And he answered, The children God has graciously given your servant. Then the slaves and their children approached him and bowed down. Leah and her children also approached and bowed down. And Joseph and Rachel approached and bowed down. So Esau said, What do you mean by this whole procession that I met? To find favor with you, my Lord, he answered. I have enough, my brother Esau replied. Keep what you have. But Jacob said, No, please. If I found favor with you, take this gift from me, for indeed I've seen your face, and it's like seeing God's face since you've accepted me. Please take my present that was brought to you because God has been so gracious to me. I have everything I need. So Jacob urged him, and he accepted. Then Esau said, let's move on, and I'll go ahead of you. And Jacob replied, my Lord knows that the children are weak. I have nursing flocks and herds. If they're driven hard for one day, the whole herd will die. Let my Lord go ahead and his servant of his servant. I will continue on slowly at a pace suited to the livestock and the children until I come to my Lord at Seir. Esau said, well, let me leave some of my people with you. But he replied, why do that? Please indulge me, my Lord. That day Esau started on his way back to Seir, but Jacob went to Succoth. He built a house for himself and shelters for his livestock. That is why the place is called Succoth. After Jacob came from Paddan Aram, he arrived safely at Shechem in the land of Canaan and camped in front of the city. He purchased a section of the field where he had pitched his tent from the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of silver. And he set up an altar there and called it. Some of your Bibles say El Elohim Israel, but the translation is God, the God of Israel. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you this morning and we need to hear from you. And God, we need uh, the truth that your word offers us this morning. God, I pray first for those who have not been reconciled to you through Christ Jesus. God, I pray that they would understand this morning through the power of your word what it means to be saved and to be made right with God. But I also pray for those who need to be reconciled with another, a family member, a friend, a neighbor, someone whom the relationship has been broken. God, I pray through your word you would show what needs to happen and what is necessary to take place in our own hearts if you're to put together and rebuild these bridges that have been broken and burned. God, we love you and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. One of the most devastating things about the last two years, aside from the physical, uh, you know, just devastation from the sickness and the illness that's been running rampant through our world, is to watch the tension between people, person and person, relationship that's taken place. Not only have we seen the death of civility (laughs) in the world, people aren't, like in the South, they used to at least pretend to be nice. Now nobody's even pretending anymore. Everybody's just being mean. Uh, It's like you go to the store, they're mean. You're driving, they're mean. Everybody's mean everywhere. And people are just, they're tired, they're ragged, they're fed up, and they just don't want to deal with it anymore. But the thing that's really been hard to see is to watch what's happened in relationships that were once close, families, friendships, to watch people over politics divide and separate from one another, to watch over personal decisions about health care, watch relationships separate. I'm not talking to them anymore. If they're going to do that, I'm not going to do this and that, and everything's a fight. And to watch the damage that's done, and it's not just the last couple years, we see it often throughout the church, throughout our families, throughout friendships, relationships that are broken, bridges that get torn down, and it seems as if they can never be mended so that those relationships can be put back together. But that's not the way God intended us to live. See, so many relationships that have been broken, when God created the world, we see in the creation account in Genesis, it says that he made it and he made it good said that God made it and said this is good. And what's amazing is that he even made people good. (laughs) 
to start with. And, you know, it's one of those things that he made us to live in unity, harmony, affection, trust. There was to be intimacy between people and God, but also between people and people. And so what happened? Well, sin happened. You look at Genesis chapter 3, as soon as sin enters the picture, you see the beginning of the deterioration of relationships. You see the first murder takes place, and it happens at the hands of one brother on another brother, Cain and Abel. And from there, relationships, families, distrust, anger, animosity, bitterness, it continues to build. And so what we find is that sin separates us from God, but also from each other. So this morning, we're going to look at reconciliation according to God's word. Now, understanding reconciliation, first you need to understand what we mean by that term. The word reconciliation is when two parties come together across sin to be reunited. We see the greatest picture of this in our relationship with Jesus, the fact that we can be saved. Sin separates sinful man from a holy God. And so for us to be reconciled or to be made right with God, he came across our sin through the person of Jesus Christ so a way could be made for us to be brought back together. So if we are in Christ, we can be made right with God. Our sin that separates us can be forgiven, can be washed away. And in the same way, if two individuals, whether they are family, friend, neighbor, stranger, if they are to reconcile, that means there is some sin that's going to be come across in order for that relationship to be made right. Now, this is hard. That's why it's easier to forgive than it is to reconcile. See, forgiveness just takes one person. Reconciliation takes two people. To use a musical analogy, uh, forgiveness is a solo reconciliation is a duet. And for that duet to happen, both people have to know their part and be willing to sing it. See, you can forgive someone who's done something to you or against you that harmed you, hurt you. You can, God can bring you to a place where you can forgive them of the wrong that's been done to you, but they may never choose to reconcile with you and rebuild the relationship. In order to reconcile, both parties have to decide that they're going to come together and let's put this thing back together and allow God to rebuild and restore what's been broken. See, we learn from this story that the hardest relationships are with family, period. It's with your blood family and a lot of times with your church family. I cannot tell you, well, I could tell you, but I'm not going to tell you the stories. In this very church, for years, person will sit on this side, the other person will sit on that side. They got crossways at some point in the past. Both keep coming to the same church, voiding each other like two magnets turned opposite. It's like they went upstairs, I'll go downstairs. They went in that bathroom, I'll go to that bathroom. They went to that class, I'm going to start going to this class. And what's amazing is when you, you start, and, and people go, well, I can't believe that, but you do the same thing with your family that you're crossways with. It's, well, is so-and-so going to be there? Well, I'll come at this time, and well, they can come at that time, and then we'll trade presents on this day, and we'll do that. Some of this sounds familiar, doesn't it? Because relationships are messy, and they're so hard with family because the people we love the most wound us the deepest. And we see that here with Jacob and Esau, and I know, I already know what you're thinking. You're going, well, Josh, whatever you're going to say, nobody's situation is as bad as my situation. My situation is the worst situation, and there's never been anybody with a worse one, and so that means I can't get put back together. Could I turn your attention to Jacob and Esau? Let me tell you a little bit about Jacob and Esau. Uh, many of you have been doing Bible reading plan this year. Uh, you probably started in Genesis, and so many of you have read some of these stories. But if you're not familiar with Jacob and Esau, let me tell you a little bit about Jacob and Esau. Twin brothers born to Isaac and Rebekah, and they were fighting with each other from the day they were born. The account in Genesis says that literally Esau was the firstborn. He is born first. And then it says that literally Jacob is born coming out, grabbing onto the heel of his brother. They were at odds with each other. And the parents didn't help the fact that they were at odds with each other because they played favorites. Isaac preferred Esau. Esau was outdoorsy. He liked to go out and hunt. He, he was, you know, as some would say, a manly man. And so Isaac was just preferential towards Esau. He, he, he loved him and he was drawn to him. And, and Rebecca, she loved Jacob. Jacob was indoorsy. He liked to be around the camp. And I want you to understand that the way God wired these two guys, he wired them differently and there's nothing wrong with the way he wired them. 
What's wrong is the way you got two parents preferring two different kids and constantly setting them at odds with each other because they're wanting the kid they prefer to win in the relationship. And so they're going at each other on and on. So there's the first lesson, right? Parents, you, you can't play favorites. Now, you're always going to have a not favorite at any current moment based on what's happening, but you can't play favorites, all right? There's a little wiggle room there, but not a ton. I'm just teasing children in the place. Some of you are like, I know, I feel like that's going on right now. We had a rough car ride to church. But they're fighting with each other. There's hostility, animosity, and then you have two different occasions. Jacob steals from Esau. First, he steals his birthright. Esau comes in from hunting one day. He's hungry. Jacob's been cooking. He wants food. Jacob doesn't want to give him food. He comes up with a little scheme, and he says, all right, I'll trade you a bowl of stew for your birthright. And Esau, in a moment of rash emotion and letting his feelings dictate things, he says, okay. And even though Esau gives it to him, Jacob schemes it and he steals it. And then Jacob ends up stealing his, uh, his blessing too. He sneaks in. Um, Mom, you know, she hears through the tent that Isaac wants to bless Esau. And so they come up with a little plan while Esau's gone and they play dress up, dress Jacob up like Esau, send him in and, and they, you know, they basically pull a scheme on dad who's ill and, and not in a good way. And so he gives the blessing to Jacob And when this happens, that's the last straw for Esau. He's had enough. And it says that Esau literally begins to plot murder. He he says, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him. Now, some of you have said that about a sibling, but Esau meant it. (laughs) This was not hyperbole. He's like, I'm I'm going to take, I'm going to kill him. And so mama finds out that baby boy Jacob's in danger. And she says, you got to go, man. You got to go. Stay with your uncle. And so he runs, flees for his life. He goes and lives with his uncle, and then for 20 years, Jacob and Esau are separated. Fighting from the day they were born, Jacob stealing from Esau. Esau wants to kill Jacob. Now they're apart. Now, during that time, a lot of things happen in the life of Jacob. When you read the the preceding chapters, you see that, that Jacob comes to a real place of believing faith in God. He becomes a believer, begins to change slowly, slowly, but change is happening. He gets married, has a family. He starts to work, starts to grow up. And then this moment comes where God comes to him and speaks and says, it's time to go home. It's time to go back home. It's time to go back home to these parents who he hasn't seen and to a brother who wants to kill him. And so the question is, will there be reconciliation for this family? Can what's been so devastatingly broken be put back together? Well, the answer is yes. And I want to give you some hopeful and helpful points here from God's Word about how you can pursue reconciliation with those in your life with which the relationship has been broken. It's going to require some things. You're like, it's probably three things. Nope, it's seven things. What? All right, so note takers, you got to add four, five, six, and seven under your one through three, all right? Going to give you seven Bs, things, seven things that you have to be in terms of reconciliation. First thing is this. We find it in the first two verses. You got to start here. You got to be realistic. You got to be realistic. Now, I understand some of you are already going, you're going, but you don't understand. You don't understand this person I'm dealing with. Now, Romans 12, 18 says that inasmuch as it depends on you, live at peace with each other to live peacefully with each other. And so I know that there are people in your life, there are people in everyone's life, they thrive off of drama. It's the gasoline in their tank, right? They're not happy unless there's drama. You know, you get in a family gathering and everything's going smooth and they're twitching a little bit because nobody's fought yet. So they start picking and pulling and let's see if we can stir a little something up. That'll be fun. There are people in your life, maybe they're just a contrarian. They like to be at odds. They want it to be that way. And so I understand that sometimes we can't always assume it's going to work. Sometimes you approach someone, you want to make things right, you make an honest effort, and they're just not having it. So you have to choose to forgive, but you're not able to reconcile because they don't want to reconcile. So you got, when you're entering into this conversation, I don't want to send you away from here with, with, a, with a false sense of every single time it's always going to work out great. You got to be realistic. And you say, where do you get that? Because that's what Jacob does here. You know, when Jacob is going, it says that when he goes out, it says that 400 men, it says Jacob looked up and saw Esau coming toward him with 400 men. 
Now, we'll get to it in a little bit, but Jacob had kind of been sending some gifts ahead, trying to sort of grease the wheels a little bit, trying to soften the blow. But there is no communication that has happened between Jacob and Esau. There is no way for Jacob to know, all right, here comes Esau with 400 men. Is this a welcome party or a war party? Is this a how you doing or let's get into it? Like Esau didn't send a text message the day before. There wasn't like, you know, like going, what you looking at, Jacob? Oh, Esau sent me a text message. He said, see you tomorrow. But he put a period and not an exclamation point. I don't know how to read that. I don't know what that means. He didn't put any emojis. There's no smiley emoji. There's not even an angry face emoji. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. And he doesn't know. And so he's going, he sees 400 men coming, so he starts to make a preparation. And there are some, you see, he starts lining everybody up. He takes uh, the servants and he puts them up front with their children. He's lining everybody up in groups. So one woman with these kids, another woman with these kids, and then he goes through, and, and, and each woman with a group of kids, and he lines them all up. And there's some people who have, who have given commentary on it, and I don't think they're right, who are like, oh, Jacob was a weenie and a scaredy cat, and so he was making this human shield between him and Esau. But that can't be true because it says that Jacob goes out in front of them. So he puts himself between his family and Esau. So why is he lining them all up like that? Because if things go south, they're going to have to run. If Jacob goes out and doesn't receive a warm welcome, if Esau follows through on the plans he had made 20 years ago, it's going to have to be that you take these kids and go that way, and you take these kids and go that way, and you make sure that you're taking care of them. He's making plans. He's hoping for the best, but he's planning for the worst. He's realistic that I don't know how this is going to go. And so when he splits them up like that, and that you say, well, what practical lesson is that for me? you got to take precautions. If you're going to initiate this conversation with whomever this is, and I know what happens in sermons like these. God's already plucked them right here in between your eyeballs, right on the front of your brain. You're already thinking about them. You're seeing their face, and it's kind of already made you mad all over again. It's like, I, I didn't come to church to think about them. It's like, I don't want to think about them. But if you're going to initiate this conversation, if you're going to begin this process of reconciling, you, you may, for some of you in certain situations, you may have to make some plans. You may need to have a witness. You know, <laughs> maybe need a third party. Bring a friend. You may need a pastor to help sit down with both of you. I mean, if, if they're plotting harm, like meet in public at a coffee shop, it's like, well, maybe they won't do it at Starbucks. You know, maybe they won't make a scene here. But you're going to have to be realistic, take the precautions. But no, listen, hope for the best, but plan for the worst because it doesn't always work out. Now, we've got to be realistic, but we also got to be humble. Now, we see here in verse 3, it says that when Jacob goes out in front of that group, it says he goes out and bows to the ground seven times. Humility is a virtue, not a vice. We live in a society that, that, uh, that celebrates pride and you know, so, you know, bravado and all of these things and really looks down upon humility, frames it as weakness. But humility is not weakness. It takes a lot of strength to demonstrate humility. Meekness is not weakness. If you think being meek is weak, try being meek for a week, is how the line goes from a song that I love. It, see, humility is the virtue. And humility is important because it's disarming. Esau's coming. Jacob doesn't know what kind of posture Esau is going to be taking. So Jacob goes out, and in an act of humility to his brother, he's bowing taking a few more steps, bowing all the way down to the ground. You notice he keeps using that word, my Lord, my Lord, talking about a submission because he's the older brother and he's the younger child, even though he's got the birthright and the blessing. Over and over, he's humbling himself because Jacob knows he's the one who did wrong. He's the one who stole. They're in this situation because of the things that he did. And so he is humbling himself as he's going towards him. But that humility is disarming. When you go into a situation, and I'm speaking specifically to people in this room, who you are at fault, and there are things that you did that brought about some of the tension and brokenness in the relationship, wrongs that you did, there is going to have to be a humble moment where you determine, I'm going to take ownership, 
And I'm going to go and say, listen, I know things are bad and I know we've both said stuff, but listen, I'm coming to you because I was wrong. I made mistakes. I know that I hurt you. And whether they forgive you or not, whether they receive it or not, the fact that you humble yourself, it takes and it gets people off of their heels and out of a defensive posture and it brings them to the table where things can actually happen. See, if you've sinned against someone, you've got to be humble enough to be able to to repent if you're going to be reconciled. Because listen, reconciliation will not happen unless one party is willing to be humble. Two prideful parties will never, and you're like, well, I'm not going to reconcile with them until they reconcile with me. Well, guess what? Y'all are never going to be reconciled. It's never going to happen until someone's willing to humble themselves. That's the beautiful picture you think about it. We're at odds with God. And it says that he initiates reconciliation with us. Why? Because Jesus Christ humbles himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so we've got to be willing to be humble. You've got to be realistic, also got to be humble. Here's number three. I want you to be hopeful. You're like, gee whiz, you're talking about re- reconciliation, like plan for the worst, hope for the worst. But I do want you to be hopeful because God really can put it back together. You say, what do you, how do you know? Because he did it right here. Look at this beautiful picture in verses four and five. It says that Esau ran to meet him, hugged him, threw his arms around him, kissed him, and then they wept. When deeply broken relationships, I'm talking about the ones that haunt you, when they are restored, it brings such a deep joy There is a depth of joy that is almost difficult to explain. You see it playing out here after 20 years of separation. This is the moment of restoration. And it was such a beautiful moment because they're almost childlike in their response. It says that Esau ran. In that culture, men didn't run. Kids ran. But here's his brother who he hasn't seen in 20 years. And it's clear that by God's grace, something has happened inside of Esau because he runs out to meet him. They fall into each other's arms. They're hugging each other. They're kissing on each other. Man, they're crying. They're slobbering. It's a beautiful picture of God putting back together what seemed to be irreparable. See, Esau had wanted, think about how bad it had been in this family. You say, well, what's with the big old blubber fest? Esau wanted to kill him. Jacob stole from him. Because things had gotten so bad and they lived apart for so long, Jacob's kids had never met their uncle. They had never even met their grandparents. These families had had no relationship for two decades because these two had been at odds with one another. And suddenly all of that dysfunction, all of that destruction, all of that brokenness is being brought back together and healed and restored. And when God puts those broken pieces back together, it brings about a joy and an emotion that is so worth it. And it spills over in this emotional reunion that they have. You see, the family's been destroyed. It's being put back together. That is worth it. That's worth the humility. That's worth the preparations. It's worth the risk that it might not go well. I can't promise you that it'll work, but I can offer you the hope that it's possible. So when you enter into this process, enter it hopefully that God can do for us what he did for Jacob and Esau. So be realistic, be humble, be hopeful. Now we're going to get real practical. Be supportive. Be supportive restoration and reconciliation, it happens not just between individuals, it also happens between families. Because when two people in a family get at odds, the whole family gets at odds. Why? Because everybody's taking sides. You got to take a side. You can't be Switzerland and family stuff. You got to pick. And if you're a spouse, your side's already been picked. You don't get to pick. It was picked for you. And there, and you know, you'll have to say, you'll be like, I hate that guy. Why do you hate him? My, my wife hates him. <laughs> what do you, I don't know, man. She hates him real bad, so I hate him too. That's, that's how it works. <laughs> but you see here the family being restored. You, you notice there that Esau looks up, he's like, who are all these people? He says, this is the family that God's graciously given me. And then in verse 6, it says that the slaves and their children approach and bow down. Leah and her children approach. And then Joseph and Rachel, they come and bow down. They follow Jacob's lead. 
Jacob bowing down, coming, they come and bow down. But boy, this could have gone sideways. Like there is a scenario here where Rachel goes in to give the hug and with a smile like this starts talking in his ear, going, boy, you may have him fooled, but you don't got me fooled. You're as ugly as he said you were. Mm -hmm. And you look dumber than he said you were. And you may have him fooled, but you don't have me fooled. And I can tell you, I don't, y'all may have it worked out, but we're not good. And I don't want your kids anywhere near my kids. And don't think that we're going to be playing nice with all this stuff. And then bow down a good way, so remember that. Okay. <laughs> and you're laughing because it happens. You know this is true. Especially in marriage. Listen, you, you, you got to remember that spouses can be the greatest help or the worst enemy. And if you're here and your spouse comes to you, listen, and, and I know how hard this could be. For, for a year, five years, ten years, your spouse has just been like, they're the worst, they're the worst, they're the worst, they did this, they did that. And you, you, you've taken that offense because you love them so much and how could someone treat this person you love? And then suddenly, you, you, so you're like, yeah, I'm in. And then God does a work in their heart and they come to you and they're like, you know what? I think God wants me to make things right. I'm going to go and try to reconcile this. And you're like, wait, what? So I'm not supposed to be mad anymore? Well, what? You have to be supportive. You have to say what God's doing. I want to be a part of this work. I want to help bring this about. They follow the example. And so if you're here and you're a parent, you've got kids that are at odds. If and when God finally moves and starts to put it back together, you're not helping when you're like, well, but did you also talk to him about that other thing? Why don't, what are you doing? Don't just throw a grenade in the room where the work's being done. And don't make it about you. And go, well, I know that you guys have worked things out, but they still need to apologize to me as well. This has been hard on me too. Would you? God is putting things together and you're going to be the stick in the spokes. Now you step back and go, I see what God's doing, and I want this to be a part. And you know what? What God starts, he's going to see through and finish. In the first conversation, they may not get to your list of offenses. It's going to work on them first. So work together. Be supportive. Be prayerful. Be encouraging. Don't stoke the fire. Be a person who speaks grace into the situation. So be supportive. Now, number five, you've got to be repentant. We talked about being humble, but you've also got to be repentant. Now, I said that earlier, before Jacob goes, um, he's sending stuff ahead. He's sending gifts. He's sending all these things. And he's not like just sending an edible arrangement to try to soften the blow. What he's doing is he's making restoration. Like, I stole from my brother. I need to demonstrate that I know that what I did was wrong. So I'm going to send things in advance for him to receive so he sees that I understand that what I did was wrong. So he stole, and so now he's sending gifts as restitution. And this is part of repentance. It's not just about being sorry that you got caught. It's about wanting to actually make things right. So part of reconciliation that gets really tough, especially if you're the one who committed the offense, is you have to push to make things right. You see Esau going, I don't want this, I don't need this, and Jacob's going, no, please let me do this because I sinned against you and I need to make this right. So you know what that means? That if you stole from somebody, in order to be reconciled as best you can, you need to pay them back. That boss that you can't talk to anymore because you lost your job because you stole from him, you should not just want to be friends again. You should want to repay what you took and what you did wrong. So if you stole, you need to pay it back. And you go, but Josh, if I go and I tell them that I stole and I pay it back, they're going to think I'm a thief. <laughs> You're a thief. You stole. If you lied about someone, you lied, and it harmed their reputation. It hurt your relationship. You should seek forgiveness, and you should also go to the people you lied to and tell the truth. You go, but Josh, if I tell them that I lied, they're going to think I'm a liar. You're a liar. You lied. You say, if you gossiped about somebody, 
You damaged their reputation because you said things that you shouldn't have said, shared things that weren't yours to share. You should go to the people you told those things to and say, you know what? This relationship over here is broken because I told you X, Y, and Z. I wasn't supposed to tell you that or what I told you wasn't right. And I need you to know that so I can be made right with them. You're going, but they're going to think I'm a gossip. Well, you're a gossip. See, too often relationships can't be put back together because we're more interested in looking good than actually being good. Then looking good than actually acting good. Being right instead of acting right. Winning instead of repenting. And so you have to make restitution for the wrongs that were done. If you did wrong, make it right and push for it. And so be repentant. Go finish, go all the way. And then number six, you got to be flexible. Now, this is the hard lesson we have to learn. Just because you're reconciled, you may not end up best buddies. The relationship may never be the same that it once was. It can be right, but it may never be the same. Jacob and Esau grew up together. They lived on the same land in the same place. Esau has these grand visions of, hey, come back with us. We can have a family compound. This will be great. You can come back to the land. You can build a place. We can all be together. Everything's going to be all right. But Jacob knew that couldn't be the place. There may be situations where God can restore the relationship and things can be made right. The communication can be open. Things can be amicable. Things can be nice. But they may never be like they were. I know some of you are thinking, you're like, yes, I'm all in reconciliation. We're going to make things right. And then we're going to finally be able to take that Disney trip and get those matching t-shirts that all the families wear. We've never got to get that. And it's like the dad and the mom, and I'm just here to pay for stuff. You know, I'm so excited. We're going to, and we can get like a tandem bicycle and ride around town and get milkshakes with two straws. And we're going to be buddies again. But sometimes that may not work. The relationship may not be able to go back like it was. Specifically in Jacob and Esau's case, Jacob says, listen, Esau's like, come on, man, let's go back together. And and you see how Jacob, he tactfully resets the boundaries. He's like, listen, man, you got 400 guys. Why don't you go on ahead? And, And then we'll come behind. He's like, well, let me leave some of my people here with you. He's like, nope, you don't need to leave anybody with me. You go on ahead. You go back to your place, and then we'll be following up. And you find there, as you read it, that Jacob, they go and they end up settling in a different place. They don't end up settling back on the land with Esau. And he does that because Jacob knows, even though the relationship has been restored, there is one big problem. Esau is not saved. He's not a believer. He worships false gods. Jacob knows exactly. (laughs) I got a gasp from the front. (gasps) Yeah. Esau serves false gods. And so Jacob knows, I I can't plant my family with Esau's family. We don't worship the same God. I I can't intertwine and expose my kids to worshiping false gods. I I can't put them underneath that teaching. I I want there to be a a level of communication. I want things to be in right standing, but there's going to have to be some boundaries here for me to protect my family and what's been entrusted to me. So I don't want you to hear me saying this morning, someone who maybe damaged you, harmed you, sinned against you, and you want there to be some level of communication, you want there to be an understanding, you want things to be made right, you do not have to go back and allow unfettered access into your life. You do not have to pull down all the fences and all the boundaries and say, just come in and you know what, we'll just take the risk and hope everything works out okay. It's okay to set the boundaries with a relationship that's been restored. And so you're going to have to be flexible because even the other person may push a little hard and go, but we could do this and we can have that. And why can't we do this now? And because of where you're at and your relationship with God and where they may or may not be in theirs, it may have to look a little different, but it can still be right. So you're going to have to be flexible to allow God to set and show you where those boundaries and markers need to be. And that's okay. So the six things that you got to be willing to do, then we'll get to number seven here. You got to be realistic. You got to be humble, be hopeful, supportive, repentant, flexible. And if God puts it all together, if he brings reconciliation and restoration where there was brokenness, number seven, be grateful. Be grateful. When God works, it's time to worship, to praise, and to celebrate. 
Jacob does something when he gets to the place where they're finally going to settle. It says there in verse 20 that he sets up an altar there and called it God the God of Israel. This altar, altars were set in the Old Testament. They were a place of sacrifice, but they were also a place of remembrance and worship. And you find often throughout the Old Testament where God would do an incredible work in the life of his people. And at that place where that thing happened, they would build an altar and they would name it. And it was a, a monument to what God had done in that place. So they worship. He, God's brought his family home. God's restored his relationship with Esau. And so now he's back in the land that had been promised to him. He's got his family there. He's seen all that God has done. And his natural reaction to that is to be grateful, to be thankful, to worship the God who made it all possible. And so he builds this altar. So what would happen is down through the years, kids who were growing up or someone who was passing through would go, tell me the story about that altar there. And he goes, oh, let me tell you a beautiful story. Let me tell you about my twin brother. Let me tell you about all the years that we fought and how for 20 years we were apart. And then God called me to come home. And man, I didn't know what was going to happen. But when we got there, God had done a work and we were made whole again. See, what's so interesting is when... Jacob settles in this new place. When I was talking about that flexibility and about it being okay, Jacob and Esau don't see each other again until their father dies. Even though the relationship's been made right, even though that things are okay now, they end up living separate lives in separate places but are able to reconvene when the time and the situation calls for it and it's necessary. But Jacob was able to always live with this reminder of the work that God had done, a testimony of God's ability to bring restoration where there was brokenness, a bridge that had been rebuilt. You see, reconciliation is a demonstration of the power of the gospel. This is all about the gospel. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 18, it says, Everything is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and has committed the message of reconciliation to us. So what's amazing is this kind of reconciliation, you say, why should I even want to do this? Well, one, because it's right. It's what God's word calls for. But two, because it's an unbelievable proclamation of the gospel. It is a sermon in relational form, especially for the believer. Because think about what God has done. See, you're sitting here thinking about that other person and you're like, yeah, Josh, that may work for everybody else in this room, but it's not going to work for us. Because you don't understand what they did to me. You don't understand how bad the things were that they did, the things that they said. They do not deserve it. They haven't earned it. And they're going to have to prove themselves worthy if this thing is going to be made right. If you're a believer, I want you to hear what you're saying. Because think about salvation. We sinned against God. Our sin puts us in odds. We are in enmity. We are hostile towards God in our sin. And that sin separates us from a holy God. But God came across our sin and initiated reconciliation with us. Did you sin against him? Yes, you did. Did you do anything to earn his grace and his mercy? Of course not. Do you deserve his grace and his mercy? Of course not. Is there any way that you could prove yourself worthy of his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness? Of course not. But in his grace and his love, he demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8. So God made, he initiates reconciliation with us in Christ Jesus when we didn't earn it, we didn't deserve it, nothing we could do to prove ourselves, and he had never done anything to us but bless us, and all we ever did towards him was sin. And yet he came and made things right. And so someone who has experienced that unmerited grace, favor, mercy, and forgiveness is going to turn to another human being and say, you don't deserve it. You haven't earned it. You haven't proved yourself. You're going to have to show me more than that. No, the heart that's been truly and miraculously and supernaturally changed by God into a new creation would want to demonstrate that same kind of love, grace, and mercy that's been received towards those who have done wrong towards us. This is the ministry of reconciliation. This is the message of reconciliation. When the person says, I don't even understand why you would want things to be made right, you would say, it's because God made things right with me. 
And I want things to be right with you. When that neighbor or that other family member calls and says, I thought that y'all would never, how does that happen? You say, well, you know what? God made things right with me. And I want things to be right with them. See, it's not just about us getting our way and our life being more comfortable and Christmas being a little more grand. No, it's about the gospel being declared. It's about the gospel being displayed. And the way we live, the way we love, the way we forgive, the way we reconcile. Jesus made things right between us. He made things right with me. He can make things right with you. This morning, the invitation is twofold. Some of you are here and you've never been made right with God. Your sin separates you from him. But God wants to be, he wants to reconcile you to himself through Christ Jesus. He's, he's come across your sin in Jesus. He's covered it with the blood of Christ. He has made a way so that you can have a relationship with him. If you will trust in him, if you will receive forgiveness, if you will surrender to Jesus as Savior and Lord. But if you're here and you're already a believer, if there is someone in your life, and man, I said it, God's put them right here on the front of your brain this whole sermon. You say, God, I want you to give me an opportunity to have the conversation, to start the process, to make the effort. And God, they may not receive it, God, they may push it away. God, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know it's what you've called me to do. And God, it's what I believe you can do. God, it's what I'm hopeful you will do. And God, if you do, we'll give you all the glory for it because you alone are worthy. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. If you're here and you've never been saved, we want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. We want to give you an opportunity to respond in faith to the invitation. So in a moment, let's go ahead and stand all across the building. And as you're standing, there are men who are gathering here with their Bibles. And if you've never been saved, if you would come down and tell them, go, I'm not right with God. I need to be right with God. I need to get saved. They'll take you to God's word. And from there, they'll show you how you can put your faith in Christ and be saved. But I also want to encourage you. We're going to open up these steps as an altar. A place where you can come and kneel and pray and say, God, you've done a work in me, but God, there's this brokenness in this relationship. And you need to come and name them by name and say, God, in as much as it depends on me, Romans 12, 18, God, I'm going to seek to live peacefully with this person. And I'm going to humble myself and make the effort to start putting the pieces back together. And God, I pray you'd give me the grace and the mercy. And God, I pray you'd do a miracle in my family. Do a miracle in my marriage. Do a miracle in this friendship. God, what you did for Jacob and Esau, God, I pray you would do that for me. So if you need to get saved, maybe you've been saved, you've never been baptized, you want to talk to somebody about what it means to be a member of the church, or if you just simply want to come and pray, I would challenge you now to respond in obedience to God. Father, I pray right now that we would heed your call and not tarry a moment, and we ask it in Jesus' name. As Brother Tim sings, won't you come? Oh, Jesus, I remain standing. I'm going to give you three quick reminders before we go. There's two conferences that are coming up. One for young single adults becoming the one. It's going to be on February 4th and 5th. You can register online. It's $10. The deadline is approaching. It's going to be a great night and morning Saturday, a daytime of teaching for young single adults about relationships. That deadline is this week. Also the next session of uh, Marriage Refuel is coming up February 18th and 19th. You want to go ahead and get registered for that as well for married couples whatever stage your marriage is in. It will be of benefit to you. Child care provided Friday night, Saturday. You'll have activities on your own. And then the last thing I want to remind you of is Brother David has some of you folks in the primetime ministry who are going to Lake Yale. You have a meeting right after this service over in the primetime center. And he wanted to remind you, me to remind you to be there. Be back this Wednesday night. We're going to be moving through our series, The Red Thread. I'll be in Deuteronomy this week. And then we've got kids choir, student ministry. We're thankful for all that God has done. Let's pray together. God, we love you. We thank you for this day. Thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for the grace and mercy you've shown us. 
And God, I pray that what you've done in us, that God, you would allow us to carry that ministry of reconciliation into our homes, into our neighborhoods, into our workplaces, and that God, we wouldn't be agents of division, but that God, we'd be agents of restoration and reconciliation. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Keep the darkness.